Donald Trump did an interview with Televisa Univision that produced a truly impossible to comprehend moment. I have for you one of the strangest Donald Trump interview moments we've looked at in a very long time. I've probably watched this clip like 10 times already trying to understand what the heck he's talking about. So Trump is doing, you know, his normal Trump things initially, promising to lock up his political opponents if he gets in office and wrongfully accusing Biden of doing that to him. Then he gets sidetracked. And what I want to do is first focus on this truly bizarre claim he makes about, I guess, how many supporters he thinks that he has. Can't really tell exactly because of how incoherent it is, but that I think is what he's trying to say. We'll address that. Then we'll circle back to his dangerous authoritarian impulses in the clip as well. With that being said, here it is. Biden is a man who uh, has unleashed something that's a very bad thing, because when that happens to me, it can happen to them. And, you know, he's a very corrupt president. You say they weaponized the Justice yeah. Department, they weaponized the FBI. Would you do the same if you're reelected? Well, the, he's unleashed something that everybody, we've all known about this for 100 years. We've watched other countries do it. And in some cases, effective. And in other cases, the country is overthrown or it's been totally ineffective. But we've watched this for a long time. And uh, it's not unique, but it's unique for the United States. Yeah, if they do this, they've already done it. But if they want to follow through on this, uh, yeah, it could certainly happen in reverse. It could certainly happen in reverse. What they've done is they've released the genie out of the box. You understand that. They've done something that nobody thought would happen. They've taken a president who is very popular. I got 75 million votes, much more than that, I believe. Mm -hmm. No president's ever gotten that many votes. And they've taken that number of people, and I think you can double it or almost you can triple it in terms of the real, the feeling. You can't do that. Okay, I got out my notebook and a pencil to try to decipher what he's trying to communicate there. I wrote down what he said, so let me read through it, then we'll do the math. They've taken a president who was very popular, 75 million votes, much more than that, I believe. No president has ever gotten that many votes. And they've taken that number of people, and I think you can double it, or almost you can triple it, hmm, in terms of the feeling, you can't do that. No president has ever gotten that many votes. So 75, even though he got 74.2, so you would round down typically, but he rounds up, okay, 75. And they've taken that number of people and I think you can double it or almost you can triple it. Pause in terms of the feeling. So let's do the math. I'll put it up on screen. 75, we're just taking his number again, more accurately said 74, but 75 times three, because he says you could triple it, 225 million people. What exactly is he asserting about 25 million people? Not sure. It sounds like that's how many people he's saying feel like they support him or agree with him or voted for him. Is that what he's trying to say? Because he's saying multiply 75 times three. Truly confusing. To contextualize this, 155 million people voted in the 2020 election. 81.3 million voted for Joe Biden. So 155 million. He's saying 225 million people something in association with his vote tally of 75 in his mind. And less than 225 million people, I might add, even are registered to vote in the United States. So I think he's trying to say, if you really think about it, 225 million people are my supporters. That's my real base. That's how many people really wanted to vote for me. Very mind boggling. Now, the confused nature, just quickly, I want to remind you of this other clip of what we just watched, reminded me of this moment from a past interview. So we have the worst education almost in the large world, the, uh, the world that people know about. Oh, the large world that people know about as opposed to the small one that people don't know about. Here's the spooky thing, though. That idea that Trump is promoting in the initial clip that we watched actually resonates with a lot of his supporters. The idea that essentially the entire country loves Trump and no one is really voting for Biden. And so, yes, saying, all right, you take 75 million people who voted for him. Really, it should have been 225 if you really think about it. It actually makes some sense in the sort of worldview some people are operating within somehow. And 
As a reminder, what was the particular wording Trump used in that clip? Almost you can triple it in terms of the real, the feeling. In terms of the feeling, he says. The feeling. It's as if he is tapping into what his followers really base their perception of the stolen election idea and all these different things off of, which is the feeling about it. I've now been to so many rallies where Trump supporters attempt to refute my explanation about how the 2020 election was secure and legitimate by saying, well, look around, look at all these supporters. Do you think Trump really lost if this many people are here to see him speak? I've never even met, they'll say, someone who voted for Joe Biden. And I've been having fun playing past clips of interviews I've done with Trump supporters lately just to contextualize some of these conversations and put a face to the term Trump supporter within these discussions. So let's do it again here. Here's a couple examples of the sort of logic some of his followers and he is working with. Then we have much more to discuss on the Univision interview. Um, and then 2020, you think it was stolen? Yes. From Trump? For sure. And what makes you believe that? I just, I believe it. I, I, when I registered vote here in Austin, the register in Austin, Texas, man, when I was uh, changing states and she was laughing at me like a week and a half before the election, going, ha ha, this election's already been decided. I was in the car, I had a witness, I'm a caregiver, I was driving this like... Do you think she just meant since Biden was so ahead in the polls? No, he was not ahead in the polls. And no, definitely. No, I mean like uh, no, polling. No, was cynical and uh, no, 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 no. Because I bet money with somebody that Biden would win, but it wasn't because I had inside information. I don't have inside information. It's just a feeling. Just a feeling? And, and, and just with the common, I mean, just walk around, walk around, walk around the people. Walk people around. What makes you believe Trump won? Because he has the majority of people. Even though the it, official it, vote counts here. don't show that? It was a fraud. Mm -hmm. What people did, they, they deceived. Were you saying... Looking around here it helps you to see that the majority is with Trump? Definitely. So we, here's, we love President Trump. The American people love America. Here's kind of a, an analogy. Do you know who Taylor Swift is? Yes. The pop artist? Yes. So I've gone, she's, she's great. I've gone to one of her concerts before. And it's this massive stadium, probably three, four times the amount of people who will be at this event there to see Taylor Swift. And so there it would seem like everyone knows and loves Taylor Swift. But we understand if you polled Americans, it probably wouldn't be a majority who are fans of Taylor Swift. And so that kind of gives you a sense of when you're within a bubble, it can seem like everyone loves a particular thing or is a fan of a particular person, when in reality, the broader world doesn't actually match that. And so we have to look at things like data, um, empirical information, such as our election results, to understand what the actual majority wants. He won fair and square. He got, he got the majority. He, we love him as the American people. So I'm not even trying to ridicule, but that's it right there. A lot of the reason Trump can say, if that's what he was trying to assert in the clip we watch, over 200 million people support him in the U.S., which we've heard him say things like that in the past, and his followers can believe the election was stolen because so many people support Trump, how could he not have won? Is because there's an inability to understand the reality that we all have to accept, which is that the world, the large world, as Trump would say, is bigger than our personal experiences of the world. Because if you can't do that, then yes, for a Trump supporter who lives in a pro-Trump community, it's going to feel like all 300 plus million people in the country love Trump and he never could have lost an election. Just like how if I base my perception of the world purely on my day-to-day -day personal experiences, I'd think everyone cares a lot more about the Chips and Science Act of 2022 than most Americans actually do. So instead, we have to get a broader understanding of the world through literature, empirical data, stats, studies, etc., and then blend that with our personal experiences. Moving on, here is more from the Univision interview. When you're president and you, you've done a good job and you're popular, you don't go after them so you can win an election. They've done indictments in order to win an election. They call it weaponization. And the people aren't going to stand for it. But yeah, they have done something that allows the next party. I mean, if somebody, if I happen to be president and I see somebody who's doing well and beating me very badly, I say, go down and indict them. Mostly, that would be, you know, they would be out of business. They'd be out. They'd be out of the election. So he genuinely is running on the platform of, I'm going to indict my political opponents. And as we've gone through a million times, Joe Biden, based on all available evidence, has stayed completely separate from any investigations and prosecutions into 
Donald Trump, plus two of Trump's indictments came out of jurisdictions that Biden has no power over. So what do you say on those, those non-federal jurisdictions? Plus, there's damning evidence against Donald Trump that definitely at least warrants indictments. And later in the clip in a part that we didn't watch, he continues to perpetuate the idea that he's being indicted for challenging the election or for his freedom of speech about the election. And that actually serves as proof, those sorts of statements from him, that even he knows these indictments are damning because otherwise he would address the facts of them and not make up nonsense about what they relate to because it's not about his speech about the election. It's about his actions, his alleged criminal conspiracy to overthrow the results and disenfranchise millions of voters, to block the peaceful transfer of power, assert fraudulent electors, etc. Also, by the way, going back to him wanting to lock up his political opponents, we've seen reporting from the Washington Post in recent days, as I covered previously, that indicates plans are actually being made behind the scenes in Trump world to prosecute his critics if he becomes president again. This is real and dangerous stuff being put together. Now, I wanna focus on one other aspect of how he's been wording these sorts of sentences. This time, here's another example of the promise of locking up his political opponents that we've looked at a few times now from a rally, and see if you pick up on something strange. Remember, it's a, it's a Democrat charging his opponent. Nobody's ever seen anything like it. That means that if I win, and somebody wants to run against me, I call my attorney general, I say, listen, indict him. Well, he hasn't done anything wrong that we know of. I don't know. Indict him on income tax evasion. You'll figure it out. So I've actually really never taken note of this, but he says when he's saying he's going to lock up his political opponents that he'll ask his attorney general to indict someone who's running against him. And he said something similar in the Univision interview. He says he'll force them to drop out of the election. If he did, God forbid, win in 2024, he wouldn't be able to run again. So why he keeps acting like someone may be running against him in an election in the future is a little bit freaky, I gotta tell you. What do you have in mind there? Now, I wanna continue doing what I did in a video yesterday and provide for you the juxtaposition between the parties going into 2024. Trump is going to be the nominee on one side, and this is what he's concerned with. His platform is one of retribution, of personal grievances, of fundraising to pay off his own legal bills as he's being held accountable for his own actions while Biden's is something very different. Here's Biden during a recent speech where in the first part, it's just funny. Someone stumbles who's in the audience and makes a thud noise and Biden has a pretty comedic response. And then he gets back to the subject at hand and take note of where his focus is. Look, that view is that American workers are ready to work harder than anybody else, but they just need to be given a shot, a fair shot and a fair wage. That's not too much to ask. You okay? <laughs> I want the press to know that wasn't me. <laughs> you know, my dad used to have a saying, for real. he say, Joey, a job's about a lot more than a paycheck. It's about your dignity. Yeah. It's about, no, it really is about respect. It's about your place in the community. So I'll be able to go home and look at your kid in the eye and say, honey, it's going to be okay and mean it. Yeah. Well, guess what? That's exactly what's happening in Belvedere again. Yeah. With this UAW contract, you'll be treated fairly. You'll get a fair share of what you produce and you'll get the dignity and respect you deserve right here at home. Yeah. So for our podcast listeners, just to clarify, after he said that he wanted the press to know that it wasn't him falling because of his past falls, he jokingly sort of stumbles around on the stage, which is hilarious. Come on, that's pretty good. But then while he's speaking in front of the United Auto Workers, he brings the focus right back to what people care about, jobs, their economic dignity, their well-being. While Trump is rambling about whales, windmills, and his legal troubles, Biden's discussing real issues facing people. And it's not just words, we've gone over in depth in the past, the actions his administration and Democrats have taken to actually implement policies that match that language. Biden's NLRB, for example, revitalizing workers' rights in multiple ways in the US, not to mention Biden making history by showing up to 
the picket line with the United Auto Workers contributing to their incredible effort that eventually led to a pretty remarkable deal with the car companies that will benefit the UAW greatly. That's the difference between Donald Trump and Joe Biden in a nutshell. Before you go, don't forget to become a member at lukebeasleyshow.com slash membership. You support what we do and get the daily bonus show. Plus follow me on threads at Luke Beasley Official, Instagram at Luke Beasley Official, X at Luke P. Beasley, and sign up for the Beasley Brief, which is a daily morning newsletter that summarizes the previous day's events. There's links in there. You can go read original Luke Beasley Show articles. So many cool things at LukeBeasleyShow.com slash brief. And I'll talk to you all in the next video.